You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, a life-changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Lessons from our losses. I want to, um, let me just ask you the question. I mean, have you ever had a loss? And think about the lessons, the value, what I learned as a result of that loss. I want to begin with a word of encouragement. And the word of encouragement is just simply, and we're in Joshua chapter 8, the word of encouragement is just simply God has not forsaken me in my loss. In the midst of my defeat, God has not forsaken me. What do I mean by that? I just want to say this before I start reading, but, but what I mean by that is that God has not thrown you away, that God is not done with us. As a matter of fact, let me just say this, even the people in our life that love us, they love us despite our defeats, despite our losses, because here's the real issue. They want better for us than that. Get, get that in your spirit. Whether it is God or people closest in your life, that, let's just say it in your spirit. God wants better for me than this. That, when you open up chapter 8, verse 1, what God is saying is that I want better for you than what you encountered in chapter 7. And since I want better for you than what you've encountered in chapter 7, I'm going to give you a new strategy, a new plan, a new way of operating in chapter 8. And you remember what happens in chapter seven. Chapter number seven, they get the big head. They decide because God has already given me one, def one victory. You know, I've got victory over Jericho. I come into this small little town of Ai and I got this, no problem. Joshua makes this series of mistakes. Um, we, we, get, we get Achan who, who winds up pillaging and taking for himself what rightly belongs to God. And then they wind up with this massive defeat. And now chapter eight opens up. And before I unpack this, I want to speak this word of encouragement, because when you read chapter eight, the pericope of the Bible talks about the fall of Ai. In chapter eight, verse number one, it reads, and the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Now, let me park here for just a moment. Because when you and I start looking at the scriptures, there's a theme that shows, shows up. And I just want to say this. We have to learn to humanize ourselves. And what I mean by that is that we assume that because people are leaders, because people know God, because people understand how God operates, that they don't have seasons when they are dismayed or fearful. You, if you notice them, you've been paying attention as Joshua begins to, as God begins to talk to Joshua over and over again, he keeps telling him, don't be depressed. Don't be scared. Don't be fearful. Why does he tell them that? You don't tell someone something that they don't have a natural proclivity towards. Clearly, God is saying to him, don't be this way because I know you have a tendency to be this way. Pastor, what are you saying? What I'm saying is that we've got to recognize that people are human and we get stuck in our emotions, stuck in our fears, stuck in our depressions, stuck in our moments of dismay. And when that happens, God is like, you don't have to be like that. But he is giving Joshua permission to be who he is. But recognizing there's a human element to us. And watch this. Here's the thing. God wants more for me than that. He's not indicting him for being dismayed. He's not indicting him for being depressed. He's not the, the indicting him for being fearful. He's saying, get it, I want more for you than that. And so it opens up now with God speaking to Joshua in chapter 8, verse 1, because if we're not careful, y'all, fear can paralyze us. It, it can literally get me stuck in something. And so God speaks to him now and says, man, don't be this way. I want more for you than this. Now notice what he says. Take all the fighting men with you. And arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, 
and his people. Now, this is they just lost to them a few verses back. His city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho. So he's taking him back to the victory they had at Jericho and to its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. <laughs> that, that's just, that's just, it's just unfortunate. I'm laughing because I'm like, wow, how oftentimes we blow it. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. Let me just read a few more verses. So Joshua and all the fighting men rose up to go to Ai. Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor, sent them out by night, and he commanded them. Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. Everybody say remain ready. Come on, type that in, remain ready. I want you to get that in your spirit because you need to get ready for God to do something great in your life. You got to be ready. That's, a, that's about preparation. That is about expectation. So he says, remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing from us just as before. So we will flee before them. And then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. So Joshua sent them out and they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. Amen. Now, there are four big points I want to raise today in Bible study. I want to raise what we learn from Joshua around his previous loss. What is the lessons from the loss that, watch this, enable me now to have victory. So let me give you the first one. The first thing that I want us to grab a hold of, the first lesson, is that I need to understand that there's going to be devastating consequences. Devastating consequences is the first thing that I want us to see. Because when we start looking at Joshua chapter 8, we start recognizing something. And let me show you, let me show you this for a minute. Go back with me in your Bible very quickly to Joshua chapter 7. When you go to Joshua chapter 7, um, if you look at verse 3, this is when they first wind up going against Ai. If you look at Joshua chapter 7 verse 3, it says, And they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up. Now, go to chapter eight now. Chapter eight, he says, look at verse one. Take all the fighting men with you. Y y y don't miss it. Chapter seven, don't take everybody. Chapter eight, take everybody. Pastor, where are you going? I want you to put this down as a sub point because I, I want to minister this for a few moments. That is, we always have to work harder to recover from lost ground. Let me, and this, I want to just hang out here for a moment because most of us, and this is, you know, if, you, if you're a person that employs people, you can, you can just thank me later. Just send me a text, email, say, man, thank you so much for telling my staff this. We have to become disciplined enough. I want you to get this. They have to do over in chapter 8 what they did wrong in chapter 7. And one of the challenges that we have is that we don't recognize that God wants us to get it right first so I don't have to do it over a second time. And when I do it over a second time, it's going to require more effort than it took the first time. Let, let me say it like this. Where my college students at home taking finals, kind of thinking about summer session. Let me pull you all into this conversation for just a moment. When you start off freshman year with a 3.8, 3.7, 3.5, it is easier to maintain that than it is to start off with a 2.0 and then you got to work twice as hard to be able to bring the 2.0 back up to where it should be had I just gotten it right the first time. And this is y'all something that ails us as believers. 
that we don't recognize the consequences of my disobedience the first time I did it. And, and, and so he begins to kind of unpack this, y'all. Let me just say this. I hope someone can grab a hold of this. Please get this. 30 minutes of disobedience can cause 30 years of heartache. No, no help, but that's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm ready to be by myself for a little while. So let me just say it. Y'all, you could spend, you know, and you think about all, all, all you think about, you know, having a baby. You know, that, that 30 minutes of activity you wind up paying for, for a minimum of 21 years. Minimum. And so we've got to recognize the consequences of what we do. And now when we look at chapter eight, what we start to see is that they've got to work harder in chapter eight to correct what they did wrong in chapter seven. They got to bring all the men to battle when initially in chapter seven, God is like, you don't need everybody. So a few people mess up and it takes all of the work of the organization to get it right. It takes all of the work of the family to get it right. One person in the family messes up. The whole family got to change their schedule to get it right. One person in the church messes up. The whole church got to redo things. We've got to recognize the consequences of getting it wrong. And let me just stay here for just a moment. It ought encourage us to be resolute in getting it right the first time. Be honest. <laughs> Come on, Jesus, help me teach this lesson. Thanks be to God, Jesus does not have to die a second time. He's like, you know what I'm going to do? See, this is why when he could call legions of angels to come rescue him. When he's up on the cross, he got to be careful. If you remember those seven last words of Christ, every time he opened up his mouth, he had to be really careful about what he said because everything he said, because he was the word in the flesh, everything he said was going to happen. So he couldn't, he couldn't, he had to be really careful. If he, if, if he cursed them, they were going to be cursed eternally. So he would speak stuff like, a Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Today you shall be with me in paradise. He would speak the stuff he wanted into existence. I want you to get this because he knew I'm going to die right one time. That's how we've got to live. God, I want to do this work for you right the first time. I want to teach it right the first time. I want to minister to kids right the first time. I want to love my family right the first time. Come on, for all of you folk that's been married, hallelujah, let me celebrate you. For all you folk that's been married to the same person for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, that you got it right the first time. And for those of us who did not get it right the first time, we can testify it is hell to pay when you got to try to get it right the second or third time. So just get it right the first time. First thing the text teaches us about learning from our losses is that there's going to be a severe consequence for getting it wrong the first time. I think there's a second thing the text teaches us. The second thing the text teaches us is jot this down. And this is this is everybody say this is how I recover. This is this is how I recover now, because remember, I want to learn from the loss. Let me just say this parenthetically. Uh, particularly to my young people, but anyone who may be watching Bible study, learn from the mistakes of your parents. Don't, you, you, you're going to make your own mistakes. But let's not make the mistakes we watch someone else make. Let's learn from the loss. You know, when I tell my children, protect your credit, <laughs> it, it's not because I always had great credit. I, I'm grateful to God that I have it now. But let me tell you something. I just want you to, I want, I want to pull in this first point one more time, and then I'm, I promise you I'm going to move forward. But for those of us who had a season in our lives where we messed up our credit, see, it only takes about, about 60 days of being behind in the, in the credit card payment. And I want you to watch this. Some situations, 30 days. I'm 30 days late, I'm 60 days late, I'm 90 days late, now I lose the credit card. Now they come after me. They still want the money. Then they cut a deal for me so I don't have to pay as much as I own. Watch this. But then I got to pay for it on my credit report for seven to ten years. What I could have gotten right in 30 days drags me down for 77 years, seven years. It is 
the understanding the consequence of getting it wrong. All right, I feel like somebody needs to hear it. So I gotta watch who I'm running with, right? Because, because I wind up with the wrong person and the, and, the, and, and, and the police stop us, and then I wind up with a charge. That charge may stay on my profile the rest of my life. And so y'all, we gotta be so careful that we recognize that just because chapter eight happens doesn't mean I'm off the hook for what I did in chapter seven. God is going to say, if you want to recover, it's going to be harder now. I do want to encourage somebody. You can recover, but it's going to be harder now. This is why folk oftentimes never recover. They never recover because they don't want to put the work in for doing what's needed in order to get dug out of the place they created for themselves. It's, just real, just me being honest. Hopefully I'll have some married folk typing in amen or just saying, you know what? You're talking right, pastor. You, you, might, you might work it out in chapter eight if you're unfaithful. But let me tell you something. You're going to have to work harder ever than ever before to earn that trust back. You're going to have to work harder than ever before to make amends. And this is why too often times we don't get to a better place because we are not willing to put the work in. Everybody say put the work in. I've got to be willing. Chapter eight, verse one and two opens up with, in essence, God saying to Joshua, you've got to put the work in. Because there's a consequence to what you did in chapter seven. Here's the second thing. Here's the second point. Here's the second point. I'm, I'm giving it to us. The second point that we learn here in Joshua eight is about divine consultation, divine consultation. If you begin looking at this, notice how chapter eight, verse one opens up. And the Lord said to Joshua, God is in essence saying to Joshua, if you are going to get to a better place, you need to have consultation from God. Now, now this is really powerful because some of us would testify about our past that I was in the mess I was in because I was just getting bad consultation. This is why we have to be really careful around who we accept advice from. Who, who, who's gonna help me get to a better place? You and I start looking at this, we start seeing God giving Joshua divine consultation. He's in essence motivating him to do some things. Now I'm gonna give you some points to think about relative to divine consultation. The first thing that I want to I lift up is that God is saying to Joshua, try again. You've got to muster up the will to try again. And I don't know who I'm teaching to as I say this, but I just want to say to you with everything in me from God, God is saying that he wants you to muster up the will to try again. I know you have failed. But I'm just I'm going to speak prophetically over somebody's life. I want you to receive this. God is saying this time is going to work. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, I know what you did in chapter seven. This didn't work, but didn't work. But I want you to muster up the will to go at it one more time. Everybody say it over yourself. This time is going to work. I'm, I want you to get it in your spirit. This time is going to work. And, and, and as we're in a season of adapting in a season of transition. We have to be encouraged that sometimes I may fail. But remember what I said at the onset of the Bible study in the introduction, that I'm not defeated, I'm not condemned rather, I'm not forsaken in my failures, that God is literally saying, I am still with you, I still got you, I'm still gonna give you the victory, I'm still gonna work it out. But watch this, I can't go fight for you. I can't be the one on the battlefield. You've got to be on the battlefield. But if you get on the battlefield, I'll give you the victory. And so there's got to be, watch this, divine consultation. In other words, we need people that will not encourage us to have a pity party. Notice what God says to Joshua. He's like, look, man, whatever, you my guy. You my guy. Don't be scared and dismayed. Stop licking your wounds. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Pull yourself together. You're a leader. Pull yourself together. You're my child. Pull yourself together. People are relying on you. Parents need to hear that. Pull yourself together. Your children are relying on you. We've got to recognize, don't be scared. Don't be dismayed. Go at it one more time. 
You know, so all those people have had bad relationships in their life. No man, no good. No woman, no good. What over? Get, lick your wounds. Move on. Say, God, I'm going to stop being scared of loving. I'm going to stop being scared of committing. I'm going to stop being scared of being vulnerable. I'm not going to be dismayed. I'm going to try again. Now, it's another thing relative to this divine consultation. He doesn't just tell him to try again. But the other thing I want us to kind of think about a little bit with this is that God is saying to Joshua, you have to have an unwillingness to continue to be, there's got to be an unwillingness to continue to be crippled by the past. I'm unwilling, I cannot continue to let my past cripple me. And I want to I encourage somebody. Yes, I have failed before. If you failed before, type that I've failed before. Just be honest. Hey, I have failed. Raise your hand. Do something. I have failed before. But don't let that failure cripple you for the future. If you notice, God doesn't even spend any time and energy. He doesn't even spend any voice on it. He, he's just like, look, man, get your men together. The Lord said to Joshua, let me, can I just say this uh, parenthetically? In case you missed Bible study last week. Chapter seven, they deal with the sin. They literally stone Achan. They literally, they, they wind up, as a matter of fact, and then, you know, he likes to set up altars. Um, and so they literally put up a marker to say this is the a valley called Achor, just a reminder of the consequence and the price you've got to pay. That was at the end of chapter seven. They repent. They say, God, we want to fix our problem. And I want you to see this in chapter eight, verse one. The moment they decide to fix their problem, God immediately speaks new instructions to Joshua. Now, this is powerful. This is so powerful because because when you and I consider this, y'all, I want us to talk about this for just a moment. Everybody say restoration. Right? Restoration. I want you to see this begins inwardly, but it's translated outwardly. It's not in your note sheets. Restoration begins inwardly, but it is translated outwardly. See, we don't really, we don't get away with anything. And when you and I make a commitment to get better, when we make the commitment that I'm going to watch this inwardly change, then it translates in what God, the favor God shows me outwardly. Y'all, I want to say it one more time because I want you to get it. Chapter 8, verse 1 is the outward translation of the commitment of inward repentance that happens in chapter seven. The moment I say I'm gonna get better, the moment I make up my mind, I'm turning away from certain things that are not good and I'm turning to God, which is good, that's inward. Everybody say that's inward. That's inward, but then it gets translated outwardly. So one more time. When I make that inward commitment to be better, it is translated outwardly. <laughs> okay, okay, let me, let, me, let me make it live. Let me make it live. Let me make it. When you make up in your mind that I'm not gonna cheat, that's an inward commitment. It gets translated outwardly if God will put somebody in your life. When you make up in your mind, I'm actually gonna get up and go to work because I'm making up my mind that I'm gonna get up early in the morning. When I make that decision inwardly, then God opens up a door and it gets translated outwardly. Restoration. A change in my life is translated outwardly, but the decision begins inwardly. That's what happens between the link now between chapter seven and chapter eight. Now, let me say another thing about this issue of, of this issue of, of having divine consultation, because this is God consulting with Joshua. That it's not just the issue of trying again and an issue that I'm not going to be crippled by my past. But there's another thing. The other thing that this, this dialogue teaches us between Joshua and God is that I need to own my part. I, I think we don't, we don't talk about this much because we want to put everything on Achan. But if you and I were to study chapter seven, Joshua was not guiltless. You know, I, as you know, my background is actually marriage and family counseling. That's what I studied in divinity school. And one of the principles that I live strongly by is there's enough guilt to go around. 
And what I'm saying is that we can look at various people's activity and act like they did all the damage. But one of the valuable things for us to do is to recognize I have a part in this. What was Joshua's part? Well, for one, it was prayerlessness. He did not seek and consult God. Watch this. The consultation that he is getting in chapter number eight is the same consultation he could have had in chapter seven, but he was selfish and prayerless. And because of that, how many of us have gone through a season of relying on our own wisdom, a season where we fail to seek God's face? And so God, Joshua was not by himself in this. Joshua was at a place also where he also was guilty. Everybody say, own my part. I, I've got to own my part and stuff. I've got to be willing to say, God, what is, what is my part in this? So part of good consultation, <laughs> this is how you know if you've got divine consultation or de demonic consultation. See, divine consultation will force you to see you. Divine consultation will not let you get away without owning a part of this. Divine consultation will force me to see me as in my part in the solution. And so and so Joshua now experiences after he after he undergo undergoes the the consequences of the decision in chapter seven. He now experiences this divine consultation and and and. I want you to get something. Let me say something. Let me grab my Bible here and show you this real quick. And, and so when you start looking, this is kind of where I smirked when I was reading it. But when you we read this earlier, he says um, to Joshua, Joshua says to him that that I'm going to give you the land. And watch. Look at verse number uh, two. He says, and you shall do to Ai and its kings as you did to Jericho and its kings. Now watch this, because now I hope, hope y'all remember the teaching. When they got Jericho, God said, I want everything. I want all, I want the whole, kill everything as a sacrifice to me. I want, I, you can't have none. Now I want you to get this. That was their first, please get this in your spirit. That was their first victory. The reason God says, give me everything when you conquer Jericho is because God is saying, I always want the first. But if you give me the first, I will bless you with the rest. And see, so so now I want you to get this. So now what happens? This is why I was smirking, because like, I'm throwing this in for free with somebody. For all y'all who don't tithe, you don't have to steal from God. You, look at Achan steals from God and it kills him. Only for God to have voluntarily given it to him anyway. You're not reading the same Bible. God says the spoil and the livestock you shall take for yourselves. You can get stuff for yourself. I don't want it all. Let me park here for a moment and give you the, the knowledge, give you the lesson. Results are better when we leave the choice with God. Results are always better. So Achan does not leave the choice to God. He takes it for himself. He takes it for himself and God is like, I, nope, I'm, that's it. I'm done with you. Had he just left the choice with God, God would have ensured that he had more than he would have ever been able to have had he taken something from God. And I just want to keep telling you, God still is such a good God that he deserves the first of everything. He deserves the first of my morning. All you folk that I'm not a morning person, you need to kill that noise. This is the day the Lord has made. And whether I'm a morning person or not, I need to get up every day and give God the first 10, 15, 20 minutes of my day. God deserves the first of everything. That's why we worship on Sunday. That's the first day of the week. That's why we give him the first 10 percent of our everything that we get, because God deserves the first of everything. Y'all. When we leave the choice with God, I'm always going to get more than what I would have ever gotten had I tried to, to wrestle the choice away from God and do it myself. There's another principle here under this divine consultation. The other principle in this divine consultation is that I need to follow close. Everybody say follow close. I, follow close is the best strategy. Um, 
You know, you, when, when we ride motorcycles, we ride in formation. We stagger our formation. It doesn't matter if it's 10 bikes or 100 bikes. The key is the person out front, the first person, the lead bike, and the last bike can't be but so far from each other. Because watch this, I want you to get this. This is so good if we get in our spirit. If I follow you too closely, we might wreck each other. But if I get too far away, I can't see where you're going. This is exactly how we as believers have to operate. We gotta operate with God that the best strategy is to be close. I don't need to be on God, but I also don't need to be so detached from God that I can't see what he's up to. Joshua goes through a season when he's not in the right space in terms of how he follows God. God now, chapter number eight of Joshua, gives him a new strategy. And he says, look, man, I want you, I want you just to stay close. Don't get out in front of me. See, chapter seven, prayerlessness has me out in front of God. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Ask you to bless me, God. And then I can get to a point, y'all, where, 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 where I'm so close and say, how is it possible, Pastor, I can get so close to God? I'm glad you asked me. Let me tell you why. What I mean by too close to God is when I could do something, but I'm so holy and so spiritual that I think it doesn't require any work of me. All that matters is me being close to God. Let me tell you something. You can be as close to God as you want. And there are some seasons God's favor will rest upon us and show us something mighty and great that we never thought possible. But most time God works in cooperation and collaboration and in partnership with his children. And so there's got to be divine consultation. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say something parenthetically. What, 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 I wanna, what I want you to think about for a moment are some of the people that you need close, I need close in my life. I jotted down three people. I jotted down three people that I see in this divine consultation. The first thing y'all I see in this divine consultation is that, and, and everybody say, I just need this in my life. I, we all need this in our lives. The first, the first somebody I need is a challenger. I need somebody. I'm not talking about competing with me. I need someone that will challenge me when I'm not right. I think we live in a church culture now where correction is very difficult. Correction is very difficult because we wind up in a spirit of offense. And then when we get in a spirit of offense, we can't move forward in the things of God because we're not used to being in an environment where any, somebody actually corrects me. We need to have people that challenge us in areas of our life that matter. This is what parenting is about. This is what pastoring is about. This is what being a president of a company is about. It is about challenging people to be better. God, in his divine consultation of Joshua, functions as a divine challenger. Someone to, I want you to get this, has to clarify. Someone to challenge me on my way of thinking and to challenge me on my way of operating. If you notice, God gives him a different operating system in chapter eight than he had in chapter seven. And y'all, we have to be open enough. Let me say, ask this parenthetically. Who's the last person in your life that challenged your way of thinking and challenged your way of operating? The only reason why I was just having a conversation with another pastor before I came out to teach. We are in a, a season where charisma doesn't keep the church open. We're in a season where it's going to take systems and strategy. And if we don't have people to challenge our systems and our strategy, we wind up never getting the chapter eight victory. You didn't, you don't, don't miss this. The victory in chapter eight comes because of divine consultation that tells Joshua to change his strategy from what it was in chapter seven. And a whole bunch of us want to keep going back to the chapter seven strategy, wondering why I never get the chapter eight victory, because I need a challenger in my life. Let me give you the second, the second spirit of divine consultation that we all need. The second spirit of divine consultation we all need is that we also all need a cheerleader. We need a cheerleader. I, I think God was functioning 
as Joshua's cheerleader when he says to him, man, don't be dismayed, don't be discouraged, don't be fearful. He is telling him in essence, man, you got this, you got this, you got this. I don't know, I mean, I know we're not watching much sports these days, right? Because of obvious reasons, but think about it. It's a reason that many sports teams have a better record at home than they do away. And the reason is because I always do better, come on, let me come get y'all, I always do better when my fan base is around. I always do better when I've got some folk to encourage me to be my cheerleader. And in the midst of changing strategy, he is saying to Joshua, I believe in you, man. I wanna put this homework assignment on us. Can we find somebody in our lives that we can be their cheerleader? Somebody we can say, man, you got this. I'm not talking about cheering over their sin and cheering over their mess, cheering. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I've got to pull myself together. I've got a new moment, a new season in my life. And God is saying, man, you need somebody. You need a cheerleader. You need to let somebody know you got this. You got this. And so I need a challenger. I need a cheerleader. And then I think the last thing we all need to move forward in terms of divine consultation is really two more. But I'm going to give you the next one, my next big point is I need a connector. I need, a, I need somebody in my life that can help connect aspects of my life. If you notice, when the marching orders go out, he sets them over and against two different, he sends some folk with him, some folk they wait to lie in ambush, and he's literally serving Joshua as his place of saying, I wanna help connect the people closest to you and those that are out in ambush. We need people that can connect us. I think too many times we don't, connect people with the resources we know about to help them because we're fearful that they might surpass us. What a great word. Can we become men and women of the scriptures that everything that I know to make you better, I'm willing to share with you. I'm willing to give you the resources. I'm willing to give you the tools. I'm willing to connect you with everything I know to make you better. That's that's divine consultation. That's the second big lesson from the loss. But there's a third big lesson. The third big lesson from the loss is that it has to be decisive cooperation. There has to be decisive cooperation. Let, let, let's take a moment, look back at the scriptures with me for a moment. And so, and so Josh, Joshua arose early in the morning, chapter eight, verse 10, and he mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people to Ai. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city. Now, notice, notice this, notice this, notice this. Verse 11. All the fighting men who were with him. Now, stop right there. I told you the Bible is not just the word of God. It's the words of God. Now, we were told early on in chapter 8 to him to take all the fighting men with him and go up. Now there's another reference here. He says, take all the fighting men who were with him, which suggests that not all the fighting men were with him. Some were in a different place. All the fighting men who were with him went up, drew near before the city and encamped on the north side with a ra raven, raven between them and Ai, with a ravine between them and Ai. He took about 5,000 men, set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So notice I got some encamped on the north and then now I got some encamped on the west. So they stationed the forces, forces plural, which means they were not all in the same place. The main encampment was the north, which suggests that not everybody was in the main encampment. Hope y'all paying attention. The main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard, that means everybody couldn't be up front. I'm going somewhere because some were in the rear guard that was west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried, went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabi to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was the ambush against him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. All the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. 
They left the city open and pursued Israel. I don't know what I'm going to finish this today, but let me give you the third big point. The third big point is the size of cooperation. That I've got to, I've, there's got to be some things operating. Now, here it is. Jot this down. Get this in your spirit. Part of the size of cooperation is there has to be contentment with my specific assignments. See, I think a whole bunch of us, oh boy, this is such a good word for those of you that can handle it. A whole bunch of us want to be in the army. We want to be on the team until we are placed in the rear guard. <laughs> if you know this, see, you can't win complaining about your seat. You can't win complaining about, we need to be content with just being on the team. You know, I'm, you know, I'm watching the last dance like I'm sure everybody in America practically is. And I know it's about Michael Jordan, but I'm going to tell you, man, I'm feeling Scottie Pippen. Because Scottie Pippen, man, is this guy that I'm just, I'm just not going to be the number one dude. And I'm okay with that because I'm participating in making you better. See, a whole bunch of folk only want to be on the team because they know they're going to be the president of this. They're going to be the director of that. They're going to be in charge of that. And if you don't believe me, you just shift some folk and, and take the last and put them first and the first and put them last and then see how content the people that used to be up front are now in the back, how content they will be. We have to have a cooperative spirit to say, God, I just want to be on the team. Whatever role I've got to play, I just want to be on the team. Let me tell you all, for every church in America, the star of the show is the media people that don't nobody see. Can you imagine if everybody in media was like, I want to be out front now, I want to run, grab me the microphone, I'm going to be the one to teach. They're not trying to teach anything, but nothing I'm teaching is going to matter without their cooperation. And I think too often times we got this spirit, y'all, where, where I've got to pick my seat. I want to be in the major place. There's another thing that he teaches them. I'm, I'm, I'm about out of time. So I'm going to cover this last thing um, ne next week, I think. But there's something else he teaches us. And that's the importance of maintaining momentum. The importance of maintaining momentum. Verse 18, I'm, I'm done teaching for today. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out. Everybody say stretch out. Stre stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward Ai, and I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up in heaven. They had no power to flee this way or that for the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw the ambush had captured the city, and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the others came out from the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on the side, some on that side. And Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai took alive, and I'll teach this next week. If you notice, there's two, left, there's two references here. Verse 10, where he has to tell the people, he has to muster them together. He has to pull them together. He's got to say, man, you got to do this. And then that act of stretching out the javelin. It was the act of saying, you've got to keep stretching out until there's the victory. He doesn't stretch out one time and then stop. He is several references to stretching out. And that's where I want to conclude today. I'm here to tell you, just keep stretching out. You may not get it day one. Keep stretching out. It may not happen like you think it's going to happen. Keep stretching it out. I want you to make that test. I want you to make that testimony. I'm going to keep stretching until I get there. I'm going to keep stretching until there's victory. I'm going to keep studying until I get the grade. I'm going to keep loving my spouse until I get the response. I'm going to stretch and I'm going to maintain this momentum. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in your well-doing. For in due season, you're going to reap if you faint not. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.